very much. Uh, before we start, can I just uh, give an indication of my audience? How many of you are supervising postgraduate students, busy with postgraduate studies, or planning to do postgraduate studies? Okay, I think I've got a good audience. <laughs> um, What I will cover, I just want to reflect on the type of plagiarism that uh, our students commit, and that what I've seen. I just also want to report on the dark force that would assist them. Now, I particularly use the word the dark force, because the popularity of um, Star Wars, and which has been uh, shown on our television again. And then I want to make uh, a very simple recommendation and conclude with one slide. And I hope to take you through a tour of plagiarism from the ex how I've experienced and how I've seen it, and how this would actually impact on the quality of our work and on the credibility of institutions. But I must also acknowledge that the text that I've used and also the images that I project here is what I've taken from the web and which I've also taken verbatim from certain issues which is publicly available. Now, plagiarism is prevalent in all sorts of fields. For example, this is just uh, two examples. The left-hand one is a pack designed by uh, Unilever. The right one is a pack designed by a South African manufacturer in KwaZulu-Natal, and they lost their case. They had to change the pack and withdraw it. That is just one example. We find it, for example, in fashion design. The person on the right-hand side is a South African fashion designer, which denies that he has copied the design on the left. Um, I do believe it's a copy. And then, of course, we are aware what's happening to some of our public officials, which claim to have certain qualifications but do not have this. Um, and this is a serious concern. So it's not just from the bottom up. It comes down from the top as well. And we are all aware of what's happening in our public institutions as well. But what is really concerning is the confidence that people have and the assurance that they have um, to display something which they do not have. And of course, it all starts at our universities. There was a couple of newspaper reports in 2014. It appeared in online news reports on newspapers as well about plagiaristic practices and students have to prosecute it. But when I looked at these figures, I say to myself, the only university that really took some action was the Northwest University. It is my experience that uh, the majority of students, when allowed, will plagiarize, and that would include postdoctoral work. Even cases where I work together with my postdoc students, students that I'm on first term basis, which are my colleagues, which are aware of plagiaristic practices that I should not do this, involuntary fall into the trap. And when it happens, they say, how did this happen? There was even a case earlier on the year, I prepared a paper and I checked it for plagiarism. There I found a section which I've plagiarized unknowingly from another source. And I say to myself, how can this happen? So it's not always a deliberate attempt to cheat and to steal. It just comes, it just happens small sections. Uh, our institution at the time also replied to the media, but they uh, did not provide any figures. I believe this was the right move, not to bring our institution into disrepute. And this is not unique to South Africa. If you read about, uh, if you read the University News and the Chronicle of Higher Education, you will find that these practices are prevalent in all parts of the world, especially the East, and in particular in countries where English is not the first language. This is also uh, an issue that uh, inspires students to do this. And of course, I would agree with that, and I think all of you would agree with me that we don't need half-baked graduates because it produces half-baked lecturers. And then, of course, you know, the saying is, if you can't do it, you teach. If you can't teach, you lecture. And if you can't lecture, you become the minister of education or something like that. <laughs> then we land up with people in decision-making positions in South Africa um, that make decisions about things that they do not know because we cannot read and we can't infer and we can't synthesize from scientific information to put information together because we plagiarize our undergraduate work, our postgraduate work, and that's how we train our students and we condone that. 
For example, our qualification verifications uh, organization in South Africa, they report uh, that about 13% of all the work that they've got to verify is false. So the issue of cheating and plagiaristic practices are all interwoven with each other. For example, there's an interesting case that the Mail and Guardian dug up a few years ago. A certain person claimed to be a professor. Um, however, it's difficult to establish where he obtained it from. Then they came up with this. He presented a paper at a conference somewhere at an institution, and based on the strength of his paper, they awarded him a professorship. Um, however, they also presented all the evidence that large part of it was copied from someone else's work. They also provided all that evidence. And if you go to that particular institution's website, you see it's a dead website for several years. And I question whether such an institution has actually got the power to confer postgraduate degrees and professorships. But there's hope. I remember one of my friends, he was in religious studies and a little bit of a lunatic from my perspective, but other people believe he was very close to number one. Uh, never did any studies, and he went overseas and came back as a doctor. So, of course, when you come back as a doctor and you speak about evolution, you attract a lot of people, and you could ask them 50 rand to attend your services, but you've never even uh, passed uh, archaeology 101. So that's a particular case. Um, so it also depends what the doctor and the professor is like. One of my colleagues mentioned peanut professors, and I thought, yeah, that is a very good term. We might have peanut professors. This particular gentleman, remember, it's not just a problem to our South Africa. He was picked to become the uh, replacement of Merkel, the number one in Germany. However, his doctoral degree was withdrawn at a certain stage. And there's a group of plagiarism hunters in Germany. They go after all the high-profile politicians. They get hold of their work and they check where they've copied and stolen work. And he became one of the victims. He was such a popular man, especially among the young people, when he appeared on stage, they played tracks from ACDC. <laughs> Typical square jaw, the he man, he's going to be the leader of Germany. And of course, all has disappeared because he copied parts of his doctoral work. And his claim was, or his excuse was, that was the practice at the time at that university. And I actually believe in it was the practice at the time at the university where he studied. Even presidents in countries lose their jobs. 2012, even research ministers as well. It's all in the news. You can read about this. Now this is quite interesting, a high profile person in Germany as well, they talk about plagiaristic practices. It's not that she copy and pasted, it. it's not that she stole work from other people. If you look at it, only, 60, only on 60 of the 351 pages there were cases of plagiaristic practices. And that was the end of her career. And remember Germany is the leading country in Western Europe. And of course, we won't talk about what's happening in South Africa. But really what intrigues me is that when you get appointment in a big organization like that, surely someone has got to check the credentials and make sure. And they would know that you're making mistakes. It was once one of my colleagues was involved in ousting a VC of a university many years ago. And they found out that particular person had two doctoral degrees that were the same went overseas, came back with two doctoral degrees from American universities. And I asked him, Cecil, how did you find this out? He says, well, every time he spoke, they realized this person was not trained in research. You know, the conversation, the arguments, the things that he said, they realized there was something amiss with this person. So what the person actually did is copied a doctoral dissertation from UNISA, went overseas, submitted it to universities, and came back as the savior for the university. But of course, when they saw the person's conduct and behavior and the things that he said, they realized there's something not wrong here. Uh, that was the end of that person's life. The real embarrassment for South Africa as such. It's available on the website. Actually, if you look at the judgment and they give the comparison all there, software program like Turnitin will not pick this up as plagiaristic practices. 
But if you actually look at the content, you can see it, the one judgment was plagiarized from the other judgment. So I sometimes I wonder myself, if it's so prevalent in the world, right from the top, everywhere, from Europe, Africa, America as well, you can understand why our students would follow these practices as well. Those of you that know or have read about Martin Luther King Jr.'s work, he also plagiarized his doctoral work and many of his speeches, his sermons. There's a whole website devoted to this where they provide the original work and the places where he has plagiarized his work from. And that particular university still has not withdrawn his doctoral degree. So I say to myself, maybe I must approach that university, tell them I will plagiarize my work, can I register there and see what they say. <laughs> but of course this will not happen. So at some institutions it's permeated that culture such that it's acceptable practice that people do this and they will actually be protected from doing this. Right, I will quickly glance over two slides. Those of you who have been here for two years ago, a couple of years ago, are aware of what has taken place at this institution. Um, it has actually been such an embarrassment, those of you that followed the international news feeds, the Chronicle of Higher Education, University News, we featured pretty strongly and it was a high embarrassment for South Africa as a whole and our higher education system. Quite recently, early in this year, there were two academics from the University of Johannesburg, Thomas and De Bruyne, and they published a two-page article in the South African Journal of Science. And they took 371, I think it's 371 journal articles from management journals, South African management journals, and they checked it for plagiarism. And these were the results. They had a count of 1 to 9, 120 of them, but look at the one of 25 plus. Close to 80 of the 371 journal articles, about 25% of the work in there was plagiarized. Now when I say plagiarized, it's a very simplistic term. This is what Turnitin would pick up, which is word for word the same. Now the article did not state if they excluded quotations, if they included the bibliography, because of course if you would check if a bibliography is plagiarized, other authors would use the same sources and certain phrases like the results of the study indicate that or a significant result. Uh, these are phrases which are commonly the same and which would not be plagiarized items, so it's not very clear what it would mean. And it didn't state that if certain sections were quoted, and of course some journals, when you have a block quote, they don't require you to indicate it with uh, quotation marks. So Turnitin would actually pick that up as plagiarized work, but which it's not. So although the figures look quite devastating, um, a person has to reinterpret if you have more about the type of research and what they've done to count and what they've excluded. But the conclusion was that the high levels of, of articles submitted to management journals are actually plagiarized from other work and of course the financial implications of our Department of Higher Education providing subsidy for work that was stolen or taken from other work. Now the type of plagiarism by our students, I've been in the privileged position where I've been uh, able to guide postgraduate students. I've also been in a privileged position to examine postgraduate work from a number of universities and also had to look at stuff from the NRF, you know, typical funding or other proposals. And also been privileged to evaluate articles for a particular journal. Now the first thing that I do, I would normally go and I check how honest uh, the work is. I remember once, I just want to reflect back to an experience, I in once inherited a student from another supervisor that has left whose work was finished and the person wanted to hand the work in. And every time I met with a particular student, very confident student, very strong on the ideas, I just could not bite his work because pages that were written were incoherent. Although the citations were there, the references were there, as each of the paragraphs did not flow into each other. And as if there was a slightly different writing style. And I had to read a page over and over before I really understood the gist of it. I take it person not English native speaking. Eventually, uh, I threw it through, turned it in, and more than 90% of the work were word for word copy and pasted from other sources. 
When we confronted the person with it, he says, yes, he's aware of it, but each section is copied less, each section constitutes less than 1%. <laughs> and I said, so yeah, he was informed at his university that this is acceptable practice. Right, now what I do, I make use of turn it in, and this is just a snippet of what we have. Uh, this is just one of about the 10 different folders I have of the work that I've checked throughout the years. And this is a typical example of Turnitin. Now, uh, for two years ago, I've been giving a, a lecture to staff members and I've taken postgraduate work from my institution. I, there were some professional degrees as well. And these are just some pages of it. All these issues in colored is where students copied and pasted the work. That's another page as well. That would be another page as well. And these are typical from chapter one, where students battle to get going and they make the proposal. That is page number one. That's page number, uh, sorry, that's also one of the pages. I think this was in teaching. Um, if I can just reflect on this, I have only found one postgraduate piece of work that was honest. The rest all had high counts of plagiaristic practices in chapter one. I ask myself if a person qualifies with a postgraduate qualification in a professional direction, how can you trust such a person's professional conduct later on in life? Okay, turn it in, talks about it. And the 10 examples which I give mostly constitute cut and paste with and without citations. And these are the type of words that they use. You know, you copy and paste, change the words, do it here and so on. They are paraphrased with, uh, they are presented as their own paraphrased work with a citation, without a citation, and they change it a little bit, you know, they use your theosaurus and they provide a citation or not a citation. This is mostly what our students do. And I think the word patchwork or mosaic plagiarism is possibly the best description. I also found some overseas scholars that talk about this as a sloppy science approach, Slodowietenschap, also referred to as a sham type of plagiarism. These all descriptive words. And then the dark force. Ghostwriters, diploma mills, fake universities, predatory conferences, predatory journals. And I know that we become victims of attending predatory conferences. Uh, I just had a paper accepted and when I checked the double again I realized it was a predatory conference and I cancelled my presentation there. 2013 they reported 2,500 bogus universities. 1,080 mills in the U.S. alone. I checked uh, this year, 51 fake universities, 210 bogus universities in China. So watch out that you don't register for a university in the Bahamas or something like that. For example, one scam now is you change the name of the university, like Rufa Hampton, they change a letter out of it, so they operate legitimately on a website from the UK, you register for them, you know the University of Rufa Hampton exists, but it's not the one. Manchester University, the bottom one is the genuine one. So if someone starts operating the Pretoria University of Technology, then you know it's the scam, that will be a typical one. Fortunately in South Africa we've got only one that I've been traced, it's the Cambridge Uni International University in Cape Town, but I think it's non-active at this stage. You can buy a degree. Um, for example, if you look at the bottom right, 320 something dollars. And they have very good websites. If you log on to them, they immediately see which country you're from and they provide uh, snippets for you as well. Oregon State has got a list of all the fake institutions going on. You can find that on the website. They've got a whole list there. It is quite damning. Printed diploma and certificates, you can buy them. Students informed me that they can even get hold of TUT falsifies the certificates um, in Sunnyside, but you've got to go through a whole process to get there because they first check your credentials, your background, who you are, if you're not the undercover agent or so, so you can't get hold of the persons that submit them. You can get people to write your essays or ghost services for you, superior papers, and they always use a Eurocentric approach with lovely smiling people to sell this to students. <laughs> SA Town is a particular good one to get your essays from. I then tried to buy a doctoral degree as an example, but I was having to pay $2,200 for it. I think that's a little bit too much. And it was only double spaced 100 pages. So we talk about 25 pages, which is not a doctoral degree. To think to myself to paying 30,000 grand for a 20 page, no. 
uh, that's not a good one. People even approached me to act as a ghost writer and I, very difficult writing. English is very difficult and the fees they were going to pay me was very little so I declined that. Not for that but <laughs> I don't have the time. Some marketing text SMLs, they say they are very honest and look at the bottom one. They say if we do the writing your professor won't be any wiser. And they say they're very confidential with their work. You've got to be happy and self-confident, so they've got to tell you that you've got to be at peace, what we do is right. And they even guarantee it will, won't be plagiarized work. Then we've got journals that predate on us. Uh, they would solicit articles for you, wanting to publish your work. Um, for example, this one particular claims to be part of the Sciences Citation Index. If you check that list, they are not. So they just blatantly lie as well. For example, this is what uh, some people say, why patchwork plagiarism is correct, is how we do it in our field. My supervisor said it's okay, I can do it. Why not? All sections are less than 1% copied, that was my student. And they say, I cannot paraphrase without losing the meaning. Actually what they say, I can't read and write English. And then they, his aspiration says, okay, I'll put a citation with it, I'll put it in quotation marks to keep you happy. It's still plagiaristic practice. Then my recommendation is we have to get our students to provide originality report with them and there are quite a few are freely available. Viper is one of them. Turnitin, I think my mind is the best. I've checked them with Safer Sign. Safer Sign does not pick it up. And there's right check that you can do. Grammarly.com is also a very good one, but they more might make use of Google. Turnitin is good. You can get a plagiarism trick. And Authenticate is also a pretty good one. This is the one that publishers use, but they are pretty pricey. If you have a look at it, one to ten submissions is $450. I got them to give us a quote and it handed out to 81,000 if we want to use it, so it's very expensive. But it's typical when a publisher submits a book and it's also more in depth and they would take like 100 or 250,000 word document. My conclusion, and I only have the one item, and I say if we do not know that our students plagiarize, um, they do plagiarize. And the problem is so large, it is so big, it's so permeated the thinking of academic and staff members. I personally don't believe we can stop it, it's just a matter of minimizing it. For example, in concluding, I just want to make this one item, a senior academic about three years ago conferred to me and says, listen, I'm supervising a senior academic at an institution, but the person only submits plagiarized work, typical patchwork plagiarism and is holding a leading academic position. So I said, what must I do? Well, the issue is that person would have plagiarized his or her master's work as well. Would do that with the doctoral work and would condone such practices with the students as well. Which means we will eventually produce half-baked graduates. Um, what I do with my post-grad students, I make sure that everything goes through to it in. I give them access, they do it themselves, they check it themselves. Before it's submitted for examination, they do it themselves to make sure it is free. And how many times they and myself find sections that they involuntarily plagiarized. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you, colleagues. This is that when you find something which your software program says it is plagiarized, you've really got to look at the content, what they have to say. And uh, Turnitin does not always show you the original source. It will show you various sources where those same phrases occur. And for example, you can set Turnitin to ignore phrases of three words long or four words long or five words long. But you can pick up very quickly when the student takes a phrase and they would uh, sit with the theosaurus and change every fifth word and change the sentences around and they provide the citation or they use it as their own work. Then you know that they can't really transfer what they've read in their own way. They've taken items, pasted them together, put the citations in, start on the top of page again and try with the theosaurus to make it their own. So they honestly believe they're not plagiarizing, the lecturer believes they're not plagiarizing, but really they can't write. And of course English is not our home language and I must also say very few of us have parents that studied at Stanford or Harvard or Cambridge and very few of us did our undergraduate degrees and postgraduate degrees there, but that's still no excuse. There's a question there. Uh, how often do you see that students get 
Sorry, how often does turn it in? Get improved is to add more defeat tests. To get more? Things like defeat things. Well, what I do know, when you submit work to turn it in, you can have an option to select not to add it to their repository. But if you do, it'll check that work, it'll keep that work, and whatever comes in, it'll check that work against what you've put in. So many times you get a report back that the work that your students have copied and pasted is the same as an essay by an undergraduate student at a university in Malaysia. Now obviously that student never got the copy from Malaysia, but got it from some public source, which that student got it as well. But I must say what Turnitin does not do, it does not show you the ideas that students have copied. So plagiarism is just not the verbatim copying of words, it is also the concepts and the ideas that students develop and so on. And that is, takes a little bit deeper, then you've got to know the subject and you've really got to spend time on doing the work. Thank you colleagues, I think we need to go on, maybe we'll 